Chapter 20. Hard Lessons. In the night sky, stars hung so low and large it looked to Tirza as if she could almost touch them. She could make out the belt of the hunter with its small jewels linking the larger ones down to the smallest ones. Tirza sighed and wished for the sleep that usually came too soon to her. She shut her eyes, but the stars shone behind them, turning suddenly to stones falling from the sky. Quickly, she opened them. Would she never forget? Again she saw the valley, the stones covering the boy's body. The boy's mother was an Israelite, his father an Egyptian. In a fight with one of the Israelites, he had blasphemed the name of Yahweh. For days they had kept him under guard until Yahweh spoke his will to Moses. If anyone curses his God, he will answer with his life. Had he died quickly? They had thrown so many stones. Tirza was so sorry for his mother. No one spoke openly of the boy, though there was much grumbling in the camp about many things. Tirza shivered at the thought of Yahweh's anger. She remembered Ram's words. In Egypt, to curse the Pharaoh brought death, a slow torture death, Ram said. We all knew this. Doesn't Yahweh's name deserve more honor than the Pharaoh's? His words are just and must be obeyed. It's true, Tirza thought, but still she was afraid. The stars looking down at her were as bright as ever, only now sleep came unannounced, making her heavy eyelids close. On the following day, the air was like a furnace. The ground baked and Tirza had no energy to spare. Helping to set up, take down, fetch water, and scrounge for food to add to the daily manna seemed to take all her time. Days were long, nights short. It was too hot to sing or joke. Only Abisher still managed to play his flute. Now Tirza was furious. Arms crossed, she stood her ground under the midday sun. Abihail's face was untroubled, her blue eyes feigned innocence. Abihail, you can't mean it, Tirza stormed. How could you suddenly turn away from Abisher? How could you let that wolf of a brother take his place? Your father would never force you to do such a thing. He isn't making me silly, Abihail retorted. Jonathan is a man with property and a leader. I have nothing against Abisher, of course. He will be dear to me as always, but Jonathan is older, more mature, she said. She tossed one thick red braid behind her shoulder to join the other. Everyone agrees that a betrothal before we get to Canaan is best. Jonathan thinks so too. Tirza stamped her foot. Abisher is worth ten Jonathans and you know it. Abihail's eyes flashed. Don't be so childish. I don't know why I bother with you. Let me know when you grow up. She turned swiftly and left Tirza staring and open-mouthed. Abihail was little more than a year and a half older than Tirza. Tears filled her eyes and she brushed them away. Uh, part of her life was gone. Things between them would never be the same. And Abisher? What about him? The heat continued worse than ever. Like dull thunder, rumblings of discontent rolled through the camp. Some of the worst grumblers went about loudly demanding that something be done. Some shook their fists at the name of Moses. Tirza wanted to close her ears to the complaints that grew daily for meat to eat instead of the same old manna. It frightened her to hear shouts of, Life was better in Egypt than here in this desert. What if their open defiance brought Yahweh's judgment on the whole camp? Late into the night, Tirza listened to the low voices of her uncle Caleb, Molid, and her father. There was fear now of mutiny. Her worst fears came with the flocks of quail. The birds flew in low, like a storm of dark-winged wind, wave after wave, dropping down to rest from their long flight. The ground was covered with them within a day's walk around the camp. All day and night, and the day following, people gathered the quail. Tirza and Owen worked until their arms ached. It did not occur to Tirza that Yahweh was angry until the next day. Abisher stood breathless in the tent doorway. Aunt Leah, can you help us? His hair was uncombed, his face gray with tiredness. It's Jonathan and our mother. Tirza's mother stared blankly at him. Haven't you heard, he cried? The plague is upon us. For weeks there was meat to eat, but Tirza hated the sight of the roasted quail. Yahweh had sent the meat that the people demanded, but his anger followed swiftly. Many who ate greedily, forgetting about Yahweh, lay silent now in their graves because of the plague. Jonathan, who hated Moses and blamed him for his father's death, was among those stricken. During the funeral for Jonathan, Tirza shivered at her father's words. This place is now called Kibroth Hatava, the Graves of Craving. When the others left, she lingered by the graveside with Abisher. Her heart was heavy for him, fatherless and now brotherless. Abisher was pale and weary from the long night watch. He raised his flute one more time in a lonely farewell song to part of him that lay in the desert soon to be left behind. As the notes rose, mournful, fainting, and rising again, Tirza saw through her tears that Ethan had come to stand beside her. For a moment, she hoped that Abihail too would come, but Tirza had seen her leave, leaning on the arm of her father, widowed before her marriage. Ethan held Tirza's hand in her own large, comforting hand, and together they wept as Abisher played. The sickness passed quickly, and once more they were marching toward the promised land. Out of sight of the place of graves, Tirza felt lighter, as if a heavy burden was no longer sitting on their shoulders. 
At Hezeroth, Yahweh's cloud stood still, marking the new campsite. Tirza unpacked her treasures and set the fish stone from Benj in its position of honor. After that, she rocked Deborah in her arms until the baby fell asleep. Leah watched her growing daughter with approval. Tirza was lean but stronger than ever, the muscles of her legs hard as rock, her eyes bright. A glow of pride filled Leah. Tirza would make a good wife and mother one day. Unaware of her mother's thoughts, Tirza rocked baby Deborah in her arms, singing softly to her about the land of milk and honey they would soon see. I think she already loves the promised land, she said. Look how she smiles even in sleep. Leah smiled at both her daughters. In Jerioth's tent, the sudden stillness of the night was broken by a cry from Mary, awakened from sleep. Cold sweat ran down her back and her eyes were full of some half-forgotten dream. Jerioth soothed the girl's trembling, brushing the thick, damp hair from her forehead and whispering words of comfort to her. When Jerioth lay down once again close to Molid's side to snuggle into her husband's warmth, he mumbled, Is she all right? Yes, she seems to be quiet now, Jerioth replied, her voice low. But Molid, what is to become of the child? People are so cruel, my husband. Can you imagine blaming the girl for being Egyptian? She is more uncomplaining, more faithful to Yahweh than the very ones who spurn her. It makes me mad. Molid grunted. She is safe enough with us. Once we get to the promised land, you'll find her a husband. He rolled over on his stomach. Besides, I think that young Ram has his eye on her. Jerioth smiled. Ram was a good boy, like his father. The lad had grown up during their travels. Yes, that was a real possibility. Still, Leah would not be keen about having an Egyptian daughter-in-law. Why was she so set against the girl? Jerioth closed her eyes and let her thoughts drift. Tomorrow, she would try to talk to Leah. Leah was not in a listening mood. She handed Deborah to Jerioth while she searched for a coin that had fallen from her necklace. The bright silver piece rolled itself into a corner just out of reach. She seized her broom and swept it out. It isn't that I have anything against the girl, she said, picking up the coin, but I want Ram to marry one of his own, someone who has roots to share with him, you know? Leah took the baby from Jerioth. Let's not talk about it any more. Anyway, who was in a hurry about these things, eh? She said. Gently, she touched Deborah's tiny rosebud mouth, which immediately tried to fasten on her finger. Shaking her head, Jerioth turned away from Leah. Some things wouldn't wait, she thought, but what else could she do now? As if reading her thoughts, Leah added, Yesterday I heard that even Miriam and Aaron are angry with Moses because of his foreign wife. Have you heard the rumors? She didn't pause for Jerioth's answer, but went on. They're saying that Aaron and Miriam have just as much right to lead us as Moses, maybe more. His wife is not a Hebrew, after all, and you see what trouble it causes. So that's it, Jerioth thought, turning to face Leah. I can't think for a moment that the man chosen by Yahweh to lead us from Egypt, the one to whom he gave the commandments, does not please him, she said. Jerioth's tone softened as she pleaded for Mary. Leah, my dear friend, we've gone through so much together, but in just this one thing I cannot agree with you. We must not forget that Yahweh promised to make our ancestors Abraham a father of many nations, to bless many through his descendants. Will you or I cut off one who chooses to love and follow Yahweh? Jerioth's eyes were full of tears. If Yahweh accepts Moses' wife and Mary as well, mustn't we? Leah was still for a long moment. I can accept the girl, she half whispered, but Ram must marry within his own people. No more was said till Tirza ran breathlessly into the tent, her face white as the broom flower. Mother, it's Miriam. They've turned her out of the camp. Tirza stood still, her heart pounding. Maha and I were near the tent of meeting. We saw a crowd gathering and ran to see what was happening. It was terrible, terrible. Tirza could not control the sobs that bathed her face with tears and choked her words. She was snow white. A leper, her hands, her face, all that we could see. A look of horror washed over Leah's face. But why? But how? She stuttered. Oh, mother, Yahweh has punished her for speaking against Moses. Tirza's words fell like a knife into Leah's heart. Without a word, she handed Deborah to Tirza and went quickly from the tent, followed by Jerioth. For three days, her mother mourned, eating nothing, drinking only a little water. The baby cried for what seemed like hours on end. Tirza rocked her, held her, walked her, but nothing helped. On the third day, her father put his foot down. Tall and muscular, he stood with both feet planted solidly in the tent doorway. His black eyes took in the scene unchanged for the last three days. Tirza, fetch a bowl of stew for your mother, he roared. Tirza hurried to obey him. From outside the tent, she could hear his booming voice. Enough, Leah. I have had enough. You don't eat. The baby doesn't eat. You will eat. Do you hear me? I won't have you upsetting the household like this for two whole weeks while Miriam suffers her just punishment. He leaned down and drew his wife to her feet. 
Now, woman, Yahweh has said that in two weeks her leprosy will be taken away. Can't you be patient? Her mother fell sobbing into his arms. Oh, Jerahiel, what of me? I too was guilty of her sin, she sobbed. Tirza stood stricken in the doorway, her mother's food held stiffly in one hand. What was her mother saying? I sinned, Jerahiel. I too spoke against Moses' wife. Her mother's words cut into Tirza's chest. Oh, my husband, I did not want to think of our ram marrying an Egyptian girl, and I was angry. Her father's voice was full of astonishment. You mean that you would not consider Mary, he asked, a girl who has left all to follow Yahweh, who risked her life to be faithful to him? Yes, oh yes, Leah cried. I am guilty, guilty. She was almost unable to stand and sank weakly against his chest. For a long moment there was silence. We will go to Aaron with an offering. It will be all right, my love. Hush, hush now. His big hands stroked her hair gently. We have all learned much on this journey. Yahweh is merciful. Tears are swallowed hard. If only her mother could see Ram's eyes brighten at the sound of Mary's voice or watch Mary's face as Ram taught her the stories of Yahweh, she would love her. On the day after Miriam's cure, when the whole camp moved on to the desert of Paran, Ram asked his mother to arrange for his betrothal to Mary. With a long, quiet look, his mother gave her assent. Tirza, dancing for joy, ran to tell Ethan, Promise me, Ethan. Promise me that you will sing at the celebration, she begged. Ethan blushed, making her cheery face quite pretty, but she promised. But remember, she said, you must stand next to me all the while. When he heard the news, over and threw his crutch into the air, narrowly missing the water pot, and whooped loudly, I am to be brother-in-law to Passer's niece, and she makes the best ink and parchment around. Laughing, Jerahiel retrieved Owen's crutch for him, inspecting it with a critical eye before handing it back. I think it's time we made you a new crutch, son, he said. I want to wait, father, Oren answered quietly. A puzzled silence filled the tent, and all eyes turned to Oren expectantly. This one has come a long way with me. I'd rather wait till we reach the new land for another. Let it be so, son, Jerahiel said. Amen, Leah added. Amen, whispered Tirza.